Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Elena Kondo, and um, I'm a um, Keller Faculty Fellow, and it's my uh, distinct pleasure and honor uh, to welcome our speaker today, Professor Michael Best. Um, Michael Best um, is a professor of uh, international technologies and international development. His research focuses on the promise and peril of information and communication technologies and social, economic, and political development. He's worked and written extensively at the nexus of technology and uh, usability, development, peace and reconciliation, um, development, of course, um, public policy. Um, and today he will give us um, uh, a view and a lens into some new work his lab is doing um, yeah, at the intersection and thinking about social media, democracy, and uh, complicated to classify speech, I will say, dangerous speech for some. Um, he is um, a professor at Georgia Tech. Uh, he's an associate editor of the Global Computing uh, with uh, the communication of the ACM and co-founder and editor-in-chief uh, emeritus of the Journal for um, International Technologies and International Development. Um, without any further ado, um, Professor Michael Best, welcome and take it away. Thank you very much, Professor Kondo, and thank you, Teresa, and the rest of the Kellogg team. And it's really my great pleasure to join you all virtually for this uh, conversation. I'm, I'm really delighted to, to um, uh, join you virtually at Notre Dame, and one day I hope to join you physically as well. I've not had a, the pleasure of visiting the campus yet, but I understand it's really very beautiful. As Professor Kondo mentioned, I direct the Technologies and International Development Lab at Georgia Tech, and I'm gonna talk about some work we've been doing exploring the role of uh, social media in democratic deepening and global development. <clears throat> so for the past uh, decade or so, my lab has examined this relationship between online discourses and particularly those over social media with elections and democratic development in the global south. And we've worked in Latin America, Asia, and in particular in Africa. And, and today I'll be um, focusing on initially on work in Africa and then work on in Asia. Our basic approach starts with uh, collaborating with a strong local partner and using action research and participatory research methods to collaborate over all aspects of our work in the deployment of social media tracking facilities um, especially around elections in the Global South. Uh, here we have pictures uh, on this slide of tracking centers that we staffed with our civil society partners and Georgia Tech personnel in Nigeria for the 2011 election, Ghana in 2012, and Kenya in 2013. And what I want to do is start with an overview of some findings stemming from a study we performed five years ago that arose from these elections in these three African nations. And then I'll fast forward to today and look at what we're doing this very moment around uh, elections and democratic development in Southeast Asia. First, let me note that all this work is premised on the development of a novel social media tracking platform, a software system that we've purposefully created to support cross-media, human in the loop, semi-real-time tracking of content with facilities for escalation and response. And we call this system um, Aggie. And there on the slide, you see a screenshot of an earlier version of the Aggie software. The basic workflow is that Aggie has, uh, is given sources, and they could be on from Facebook or Twitter or WhatsApp or Instagram or RSS or text messages. We support a whole different array of um, social media and related media platforms. Those are selected and curated by in-country partners. Reports are captured from these sources in real time. And through machine analysis, as well as human analysis, reports are triaged for rele relevancy, veracity, and actionability. And then relevant, actionable reports are brought together as incidents that can be visualized and escalated. Um, and, and that's the basic workflow of the social media tracking facility using the Aggie platform. So first, um, let me tell you a bit about some work we've done looking at Twitter in particular, um, across a range of the social media platforms we were working with 
in Nigeria, Ghana, and Kenya in 2011, 12, and 13, respectfully, respectively. And let me give you a quick um, first snapshot of the electoral politics in these three countries at that time and over the last decade, and then give you a sense of what we discovered through our analysis of social media and Twitter in particular in these countries during that period of time. So in Nigeria, the 2011 election was their third election after their democratic transition in 1999. Uh, Nigeria was still not considered in 2011 a full democracy and uh, electoral outcomes were often the pro product, frankly, of fraud or violence or elite negotiation. In 2011, uh, good luck, Jonathan won. In 2015, he then lost to Muhammadu Buhari, who um, just last year won re-election in Nigeria. Setting the stage for Ghana, Ghana of these three countries is considered the most uh, stable of democracies among them. Uh, in the 2012 election, uh, this was their fifth uh, time the Ghanaians went to the polls. Uh, incumbent John Mahama defeated Nana Akufa Ado in a close race in 2012. The same two ran again in 2016 with Nana Akufa Ado winning. And now there is an upcoming election this December amongst the same two guys uh, yet again. And we will, with our partners, uh, stand up a social media tracking project for this upcoming election in no December in Ghana. Finally, for Kenya, uh, you probably know uh, ethnicity has played a significant role since their independence in their political system. And in 2007, there was uh, substantial election related civil unrest and violence. More than a thousand Kenyans were killed. Uh, leading up to the 2013 election, communities began uh, arming themselves. There was concern of a repeat of the uh, violence associated with the 2007 election. Uhura Kenyatta, a Kikuya, Kikuyu, and Raila Odinga, a Luau, ran for the presidency. Kenyatta assumed the presidency, but it was widely contested, a very um, contested election. In 2017, Kenyatta again won, won again in a pretty controversial and contested election. And then tensions are already rising in with an eye towards the upcoming 2022 election. Again, uh, just as in Ghana, we plan to be monitoring the 2022 Kenya election. So our Aggie system is cross-platform, but for the purpose of the study I'm gonna um, report right now, we aggregated reports just from Twitter uh, and focused on uh, analysis of tweets on and around the voting periods during these three countries' national elections in 2011, 12, and 13. We accumulated three data, data sets that I, I've lost here in this table, you can see, with an eye towards uh, looking at the prevalence of policy-related discussions versus identity-focused discussions. So identity politics focuses political action on a constructed identity, often rooted in, in things you could imagine like religion, ethnicity, language, gender, community. Um, and political theorists, including John Dreisick, have shown how identity politics can weaken effective deliberation and democratic deepening, uh, and especially when it's constituted as suppression of one identity by another. So identity politics, um, while we viscerally might say seem uh, negative and unpleasant, uh, based on political theory and empirical evidence, they, are be, they also are weakening of the actual democratic processes. Okay, so to build a set of, uh, uh, we set out um, a study of those uh, three data sets by first uh, building a set of policy queries, which we extracted by uh, examining the top two contending political parties, electoral campaign, campaign manifestos, and extracting the most mentioned bigrams, just two words co-located. We also developed a set of identity queries by listing terms associated with relevant tribal or ethnic groups, religion and geopolitical re, uh, region, religion and geopolitical regions, and um, other things specific to each of these three nations that are prevalent in identity political discourses. 
so this then re uh, resulted in a collection of policy relevant versus identity relevant tweets from the respective national Twitter data sets that we had gleaned using the Aggie platform. And this table then gives you a sense of the, the findings we had uh, as we compare uh, policy relevant versus identity relevant uh, discourses in these data sets. Ghana had the greatest number of relevant policy tweets. 13% uh, of the data set was viewed as policy relevant compared with just 2% for Nigeria and Kenya. And um, kind of alternatively, Nigeria and Kenya on Twitter were much more likely to have identity uh, relevant com communications over Twitter. So um, when we look to scholars like uh, Mueller and Scanig, two um, political uh, and scholars of democracy from Aarhus University in Denmark, uh, Nigeria and Kenya at the time were both classified as multi-party uh, autocracies. So more than one party was present, but um, the citizens lacked real civil liberties or political rights and really only one party is represented in government. While Ghana had achieved a polarchy, a democracy where power is vested in multiple parties and legitimate elections where, where citizens enjoy uh, uh, substantial political and civil liberties. Um, today, fast forward to today, uh, current Freedom House democracy indices show Nigeria and Kenya is similarly situated and partially free with Ghana ranked as a free democracy. So the point is that there's a preponderance of policy relevant discourse over social media that is tracking in these three cases with the level of democratic development, either as articulated by uh, these Aarhus scholars of democracy or through um, scoring um, organizations like the Freedom House Democracy Index. Just to give you a quick sense of what we're talking about um, specifically, I just grabbed two tweets from Kenya that had been uh, re responded to the policy or identity queries. So an example policy tweet from the Kenya data set, five years on, how will we measure government effectiveness, improved economic integration with our neighbors? So this is somebody saying, look, here's the policy issue. We want economic growth. We want government effectiveness. And what we really are looking for is uh, East African economic integration. And then an example of my identity tweet is below, I'll never ever trust Kikuyu, F you, Kikuyu's, F you. So if that was a situation in an analysis we did about five years ago, um, we saw this a fair bit of policy discourse in Khan, Ghana, a little bit in Nigeria and Kenya, definitely identity discourses in all three, but even more so in Nigeria and Kenya by proportions. Um, we find that, uh, well, I would say at the time, I had hoped that social media would serve as a public space to advocate for democratic values and engage in deliberative democracy. And, you know, we did see some of that, like as was evidenced in that uh, Kenya tweet about economic integration. And uh, in the data set, we saw, for instance, that Ghana had seven policy tweets for every one identity tweet, which is not so bad. Um, social media, however, is clearly also a space for divisive hate speech. We saw that in the uh, comments of, uh, disparaging the Kikuyu people in the Kenya data set. Um, however, and also, if you fast forward to today, um, regrettably, there is increasing evidence, including here in the USA, that identity and false information is flowing with little friction over social media and there actually seems to be upswings in online identity politics, hate speech, and disinformation. And I think we all live in that reality every day. You pick up any newspaper and often you will read of these examples of social media, hate speech, and disinformation in today's politics in the States or otherwise. So the question is, where are we heading? If five years ago, I was a little more open to um, a balance of opportunity on social media between policy and identity. Today, I am a little more nervous, a little less sanguine. So let me um, um, talk about work we're doing uh, right now and how we're trying to respond to what I'm calling digital threats over social media 
now poised against democracy, and especially in transitional and emerging democracies, including the three countries from the earlier study. Um, so the current focus uh, of our lab's work is on Myanmar. And Myanmar is set for a national election on November 8th of this year. So in just uh, a few weeks, it's really frightening to think it's coming so soon. And we've been working very hard in my lab and with our civil society partners to prepare a social media tracking and response center for this uh, upcoming election in Myanmar. I think many, maybe most of you will know that Myanmar has experienced uh, in the last decade or so significant harm from hate speech and disinformation over social media. And almost and all of that has been over Facebook. Essentially the internet and Facebook are synonymous in, for most of Myanmar. The UN's fact-finding mission on Myanmar has identified the significant negative role that hate speech and disinformation has played over social media, including and up to things such as coordinated attacks against linguistic and religious minority groups in Myanmar. And these are actions, accumulated actions that the UN has labeled as genocide. So there's extreme social stress in Myanmar and tensions are significant. And as we approach the November national election, um, these uh, concerns and the way social media is a platform for this kind of communication and coordination is uh, raising in terms of awareness, concern, and potential serious negative outcomes. So uh, let me kind of give you a quick sense of, of some of the technical work that is underway right now in support of our intervention and, and participation in social media tracking for the Myanmar election. Uh, we're building NLP, natural language processing and machine language modules to support detection and processing of Burmese content with a particular focus on hate speech. Uh, these, um, there are many challenges and I want to sort of quickly highlight this of, of working with Burmese. Um, there are very limited text tools and natural language processing tools for Burmese as compared to a language like English. There's little classification data and relatively weak language mod modules. Um, so Burmese is part of a, a group of languages sometimes referred to as under-resourced. And that's under-resourced in the sense of a paucity of digital tools and digital data with respect to that particular natural language. So much of the natural language processing and machine language recent successes, machine learning recent successes, and, and you all have experienced some of these or, or read about them, kind of the, the enormous successes of recent AI systems, including conversational uh, natural language uh, systems. Um, those recent systems have, their successes have been predicated on big, big data and sophisticated text and natural language tools. And th that is not present for Burmese. And so a significant research issue that we're dealing with here is trying to develop some science to machine learning and text analysis in the presence of small data and under-resourced languages. In this case, Burmese, but you can imagine this for Amharic and Ethiopia or many other languages, under-resourced languages. So here's some current results on our ML work, um, only interesting to those of you who might have a bit of a machine uh, learning background we developed the modified, I mean, I'll go fast through this. We developed the modified hate lexicon, which we fed into our social media acquisition tools. We got about 15,000 posts. This is Facebook posts in a data set responsive to the lexicon. And then we had our civil society partners and Burmese fluent students from Georgia Tech code this data set for hate speech and dangerous speech. About 4% of the data set was coded as, as hate speech. Um, so we're now left with what we call a binary classification problem. Is it hate speech or is it not speech? Not hate speech. And we want to classify posts over Facebook against this binary problem. Uh, it's also what we call a deeply imbalanced classification problem because most of our uh, training data is not hate speech. 
And in this table, uh, and I can go into this in further detail in Q&A for any uh, machine learning nerds out there who really want to uh, drill down in some of this, we, um, we give uh, precision and recall numbers for some um, well-known classification uh, models. And um, um, we can see, so precision and re uh, recall, you could think of as false positives versus false negatives. And these numbers are quite okay. Um, the table basically says the classifiers are doing a pretty good job of correctly identifying hate speech within uh, uh, the Facebook posts and not uh, um, missing examples of hate speech that you wish that they would have identified. So suffice to say that we're doing an okay job in terms of developing these machine learning and natural language technologies in support of our work for the Myanmar election. Um, we're also, in addition, under this project, enhancing the Aggie facilities for human tracker tagging of hate speech and disinformation. And here's just a quick uh, uh, screenshot of what we're doing to sort of develop this human in the loop augmented AI experience for uh, social media trackers uh, during election times, focus on issues of hate speech and disinformation. And I won't go into this slide. Uh, because it's just a bunch of more technical stuff that we hope to do in the near future. Let me just say that we have um, all sorts of ideas about enhancing the classifiers, enabling, uh, uh, upping their accuracy, extending their scope, um, developing more post-hoc analysis and visualizations and so forth. And then we hope to develop these over the next few years, working with our main international civil society partner, which is the Carter Center based here in Atlanta, and we've lined up a number of elections that we're going to be deploying um, these kinds of facilities and approaches, including Ghana 2020, I already mentioned, Ethiopia 2021, the Philippines, Kenya, and so forth. So um, let me kind of uh, give two wrap up, quick wrap up slides, uh, which is to first talk about the type of work we're doing, and then to talk about what I think we've learned in our uh, studying of social media during elections in um, countries from Kenya to Myanmar to Ghana to Ethiopia. And first, in terms of the type of approach, uh, we engage in what I think of as action research, technical research, and social science research. Action research includes the kind of thing we're doing in Myanmar where we're deploying with civil society partners a social media tracking center that will allow our uh, Myanmar partners to um, tr identify, track, escalate, and respond to hate speech, dangerous speech, disinformation, or electoral irregularities coming over, in this case, Facebook. And so that's a kind of participatory action research approach primarily, where we, we pretty much at every moment work with civil society partners around this kind of uh, study of the uh, role of social media in the electoral process. We also do technical work, and that was the last few slides, um, a bunch of technical mumbo jumbo about our machine learning classifiers and natural language processing techniques, and especially the, the kind of science that I think we're um, helping to develop around under-resourced languages and uh, our ability to do text analysis and uh, AI in under uh, resourced languages. And then social science research, which I think is, is exemplified by the data driven social science work on trying to, to correlate or relate levels of democratic development, identity, and policy relevant discourse on social media. And, and so it's kind of a, a, a three um, leg stool in terms of the, the approaches to research from action to technical to social scientific. In terms of these two projects that I described, the one being the social science driven uh, data analysis of tweets from Ghana, Kenya, and Nigeria, um, and the technical work around machine learning classification of hate speech in Burmese, um, there's three takeaways that I also might offer. One is that democracy and human development and social media uh, describe a fraught intersection of relationships. And while we saw plenty of problems from a decade ago uh, in Africa 
and the use of Twitter with incitement language and hate speech, these problems are clearly on the rise, um, not uh, diminishing at all. And I would note that uh, the Kellogg Institute, I look on your website and it's a uh, website says that your goal mission statement is to promote research excellence uh, in uh, with a particular focus on democracy and human development. So um, you are two pieces of this three piece puzzle that I'm, I'm also quite focused on. Another takeaway is that social media analytics can tell us a lot about what is happening in our societies and democracies. So this online discourse is a reflection of real world reality as opposed to the opposite. And there's a lot to do. And that includes technical work of the sort that I was describing, but also, and more importantly, social scientific and policy work, which is often the hardest. So I'll end there. Um, I have just to um, finally give some thanks. Our primary uh, partners for the Myanmar project is the Carter Center I already mentioned and the new Myanmar Foundation with funding from Facebook. Uh, the other projects um, have a range of partners and funding sources. I've listed a few of my students because I'd be remiss to not thank them um, since they're the ones actually getting the work done. And, um, and then finally, again, my thanks to you, Professor Kondo and the rest of the Kellogg team and I hope I've, I've not talked too long and we have a little bit of time for some Q&A. So thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, uh, Professor Best. Um, indeed, I think um, the talk straddles uh, the very intersection, I think, of um, the mission of the Kellogg Institute, uh, an intentional and deliberate focus on democracy and human development in this new era where technologies and social media um, intermediate uh, almost everything we do. Um, first, before starting to uh, ask a few questions, I would like to uh, uh, thank our participants for being here. Um, as, um, as you noted in the chat, uh, you can write and post your questions as well. Um, we are compiling them and we'll, uh, we'll pass them on to Mike. Um, to get the questions flowing, I will probably start with Eric one or two questions that I wrote down, and then um, um, and we'll take it from there. Um, so let me first quickly take a look at um, the questions to make sure that I uh, have everything in place to guide our Q&A here. Um, all right, this is set. <clears throat> So um, the, the, um, the first question that I wanted to ask um, you, Mike, um, Professor Best, um, is in your experience in these three countries, is there a sense that identity politics pay either for individual users in terms of the uh, popularity on those platforms, maybe you have that data, or for, the, for some parties that may be leaning more identity politics versus poli uh, policy oriented? Um, engagement in terms of winning the elections? You know, I never had a little garble. Can you repeat the question? I missed some part of it. So I just wanted to know, either based on uh, social media, individual social media data or electoral outcomes, if, this, um, if, the tr if there is a trade-off in terms of identity politics versus policy for either online popularity for individual users or electoral outcome for political parties. So, so could, a, could a political party actually benefit from one or the other or trade one against the other? So that's yes. not something I can speak to directly in the data because we don't have reach to an answer to that question. But I think that we, but, but if we look at the literature, there are definitely folks who examine this, including in US politics, and can um, clearly demonstrate the role of identity politics in establishing electoral benefit. Um, and that's true also, we know, again, not in the data set I have, so this is speaking to other people's work or our even journalistic understanding of the, those three elections, um, especially in the Kenya case, um, there was a lot written on the role and the successes of marshalling identity for the purpose of electoral success um, by those political actors. 
and and they clearly saw a benefit because they spent enormous amounts of their politicking focused on issues of identity. So they see the benefit too. Uh, I think, you know, even right now in the U.S., we see political actors making use of identity because they see political benefit. Um, I think it's a, a separate and quite ex important question to be able to say, all right, what is that balance? In other words, how much does that benefit accrue to a political actor in what cases? And um, how are ways in which one might attenuate that benefit? Um, if you actually believe, as these political theorists have, have argued, and I may mention in my talk, that while it may, uh, while benefit may accrue to the political actor, disbenefit uh, uh, is um, brought to the democratic process itself and to the democratic systems. So if you do believe that, then one would look to ways to attenuate the political benefit in order to save democracy, essentially. I see. Thank you. I'll ask you one more question and I'll start sort of uh, taking the questions that have been posted in the Q&A. Um, your, your work has started long before sort of the rise of social media. You, you studied the early days of the internet in Africa, the rise of mobile, uh, mobile computing and mo mo mobile technologies. Uh, and before that, we had the radio, we had the TV, and you've been thinking hard about the, all those types of, sort of ICTs, right? What is different in your experience and your work uh, through using these platforms about the modern social media and how it's influencing sort of the, um, our dem democratic institutions and, and ultimately human development? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, back in the day, um, back even um, when Prof Kondo was at Georgia Tech, for those of you who don't know, he's a, we're a proud alum or we're proud of him as an alum of Georgia Tech. Uh, we really were optimistic about the role of these modern ICTs moving from radio to the internet, moving from the internet to data on a, uh, the internet, mobile internet on a, on a mobile phone. Um, we were very optimistic that this would have a significant positive role um, in uh, deliberative democracies and participatory and strong democracies because in particular, we talked a lot at, in that time, and this really goes even two decades ago and certainly 15 years back, of democratization of speech, somehow opening up the printing presses, so to speak, so that everyone could have voice within a civil discourse would have great democratic benefit. And so then to your question is, all right, what has social media in particular, this next step done, and has it changed that? How is it different? And I think social media is very different. It's even different than the web prior to the rise of Facebook, et cetera, because of the business model. So the business model for something like Facebook is, I'm sure many of you have heard this term, um, surveillance capitalism. The, the very core business model, uh, in other words, the way that Facebook makes money is it uh, gains a profound understanding of its users, just the general population that are using the platform. It um, slices and dices and portfolioizes that surveillance data from the users and sells that onto advertisers. This means that their uh, core business model privileges uh, ensuring their users spend time and increasingly more time on site and that those users divulge personal data and increasingly more personal data to the site. And it's that reality that causes them to actually privilege sensational uh, content and that includes hate speech and disinformation. So Facebook systematically upranks hate speech and disinformation because it feeds into their profit. And, you know, I, you can't make it more simple than that. They know they do it, they say they do it, and they do it. And it 
and it kind of works in the sense of Facebook is very profitable um, and disinformation and hate speech is swamping in certain discourses uh, other conversations. And just really quickly, Kondo, let me mention a recent study on COVID information showing that uh, um, inaccurate uh, mis or disinformation content was getting um, almost an order of magnitude more attention on Facebook than the WHO, the CDC, and all other kind of major um, um, well-known public health uh, resources online. Thank you. Um, so let me now turn to people who posted in the Q&A. Um, I think I, we have a few, so I'm thinking, since they are already written, I'll just sort of ask uh, those people to unmute themselves and just ask the questions directly. Um, I will go in a different order than what's listed here because some of them just build up. So there's one technical question. Some people missed the early part of your talk. So it's from Donovan Le uh, Leiva. I uh, hope I didn't mispronounce that. Uh, Donovan, if you don't mind, just unmute yourself and ask your question. I'm sure, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the, for the presentation and the, and the opportunity to ask my question. Um, it was just something, you know, that just struck my curiosity. Um, in terms of how did, the, the question is, how, how is the data gathered via WhatsApp? I can understand, you know, Twitter and Facebook due to the ability to, to post on our wall, but in WhatsApp, it doesn't really allow you to do that, probably on like a status only. So I just wanted to know more or less, is, is there like a, an agreement that you have to, to view like actual the, the messages between one person or another, or how does that work? Thanks, Donovan. So for WhatsApp, we would only be able to gain WhatsApp group messages that we were invited to. So we did a lot of um, WhatsApp group data acquisition in the Ghanaian election four years ago. And those would be political con uh, WhatsApp groups, maybe party groups, civil society groups, that invited us, essentially added us as members to their group, um, knowing that we were doing it for the purpose of uh, social media tracking. If it was just a private group we were not invited to in WhatsApp, uh, we would not even try to use it because we only use data that either is publicly available or that we are, we are specifically invited to acquire. And then in the case of WhatsApp, there's a online, um, web-based facility, kind of an API, it's not really an API, that allowed us to then scrape these, these um, WhatsApp group conversations that had invited us in and provided us uh, entree to that conversation. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, um, so the next question, I will take um, the, the question from, uh, uh, Susan Schepler, um, do you mind asking your question directly, uh, Susan? Thank you. Sure, I'm happy to. I just had a question about whether you could tell the difference between tweets that were sent by actual users and those that were sent by bots. Not, not no. Um, however, we do, uh, in many of these instances, do analysis, especially this is part of the role of our civil society or in-country partners on uh, the authors and, and we follow specific authors. So that's specific accounts in Twitter, specific posters in Facebook. And that's a curation process done by our in-country partners with the purpose of going for channels that we think have impact. Um, that might mean that we would ignore channels we knew to be mostly a bot or only a bot or from a bot, where the author itself was a bot. Um, however, we may want to track bot content. We may want to uh, tra track content from Russian troll farms. 
because actually it's quite relevant when you're concerned about the impacts of hate speech or disinformation anyway. So we have no technical, meaning I have no special magic that would allow me to, given some piece of content on social media, I can you know, tell you, yes, this was a bot, no, this wasn't. But um, we do through our curatorial processes, focus on areas on, uh, within these platforms that we think are critical to the conversations relevant to the election. And then in those cases, we may actually not be specifically interested in tracking bot uh, content because we believe that it will have some, in the case of disinformation and hate speech, some deleterious effect on the election and therefore uh, particularly worthy of tracking. Great, um, next question. Um... Uh, Professor Ernesto Verdeja. Thank you, uh, Michael, for your presentation. This was really fascinating. Um, I actually have two brief questions. One is if you could say, if you could tell us a little bit about whether, for instance, certain Facebook accounts are weighted differently in the analysis, that is because they are embedded in larger nodes of distribution and from a social networking perspective, so they're more influential, more people are connected to them, um, or is that not an angle that's kind of covered here? And then secondly, I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more about the technical side of the classification, whether you're, you know, you mentioned that the data set is relatively small that you trained on. So are you using SVMs or are you using something else? And I should add, I'm a political scientist, not a computer scientist. I know a little bit about it, but um, I'm curious about, about kind of what's happening under the hood. So how the classification so, process Thank operates. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So for the first question, uh, um, I, I would just re-emphasize this curatorial um, step. So these are in-country partners who are saying, this Facebook group or page is important. So in that sense, they're weighting those Facebook pages, right? And they're weighting things as being important or not important. Once the, they are selected by our partners as being important, and we then call them a source. There's um, from the, that initial slide on the Aggie platform, we have sources, which would be like a Facebook page or group. Um, once they're weighted as a source by these partners in this, through this curatorial process, then we acquire posts and comments to those pages or groups, but we don't further weight them in any way um, within that data set. They're all just thrown together. Um, however, then the classifier, as an example, or the human trackers can would read these posts or comments in the case of Facebook and could weight them. The classifier will assign a numeric weight based upon, for instance, its uh, sense as to whether it's hate or non-hate speech. Uh, a human tracker could weight it by tagging uh, it as hate speech or disinformation or a million other kinds of things that they might essentially weight it as. Um, so that's done either by human analysis or by the classifier. In terms of the, the classifier, we did try SVMs, but um, the most successful currently right now are balanced random forests, um, you know, which is, is kind of a, a similar, uh, I mean, has some similar approaches uh, using um, over sample data for the minority class. So again, we have this class imbalance problem. We had way more non-hate speech than we had hate speech in the training data. Um, we could say that's a good thing, which is that uh, more people's um, Facebook material was not deemed hate speech. And uh, that class imbalance created a problem. So we oversampled the minority class and used um, balanced uh, random forests and that uh, proved successful. We also have been using XLMR, which is a, uh, a model from Facebook AI. So Facebook AI created the um, XMR system and it, it has been performing fairly well and we think it's going to continue to perform e even better. Uh, and it is a built and especially well suited to low resource languages. So this XLMR um, Facebook AI system is this cross-lingual self-supervised classifier 
uh, with a particular focus on under-resourced languages. And we think that that, in the end, might be one of the most successful approaches. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, that uh, There's a version of that question that segues perfectly into the next question. Um, I will say why I think it segues, and I'll ask um, um, Jake Turner to ask his question. Um, there's also a sense of, for instance, when we see the statistics, let's say for Kenya versus, uh, for Ghana versus Nigeria, you had sort of imbalance in terms of policies versus identity. Um, if it could be that some groups have more, have more membership than others, and we are counting one identity related post in a very large group as one and an identity related post in a smaller group as one. And so there is a sense of maybe we are not aggregating well. And then I'll ask, uh, it's just a comment, and I'll just ask um, Jake Turner to turn on, to, to, to unmute and ask his question. And, and, and the best. Uh, uh, sure, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Michael, for the really fascinating uh, presentation and project. Um, I was wondering that, uh, I think you, you, you've kind of addressed my question a little bit already, um, but I was wondering about, like, most, especially on Twitter, most posts are not, don't have, uh, like geographic location attached to it. They don't have that metadata enabled. Um, so just wondering like um, how the platform like ensures that it's collecting like actually um, like a representative sample of, of, of uh, discourse in each of the countries. Because um, you know, not, not mo most, like the vast majority of posts aren't tagged to a specific country. Thank you. Right, uh, so thank you for that. Um, you're right. T tweets rarely are geolocated, uh, although some maybe 10 percent, I think, uh, often is about what we get of Twitter um, reports that would have a geolocation. We do have tra our trackers then go on to geolocate reports when they seem relevant. So as part of that veracity relevance escalation workflow model we have for the tracking center geolocation is generally something we would do certainly things that get to that stage that we call an incident would be geolocated if that is possible slash relevant um, in the case of Myanmar for the November election we're geolocating at the state and region level so if you have, can picture a map of of Myanmar and you know the state boundaries and all that would be kind of the level of accurate of specificity we would have on geolocation. Um, in terms of re uh, representativeness uh, of the sample or um, um, th that we're sort of representative across geographic locations, we actually don't do that. So we're not actually looking at representativeness geographically for any of the data. And that may make your social scientific uh, neck hairs rise or whatever, it may make you uncomfortable. You may feel like we, we should be representative geographically, but it, it's not um, generally uh, core to the goals of the trackers. The trackers really are trying to look for electoral issues across the country and wherever the hot spots are, the flames, you know, the big um, fires that they want to fight are. They're not trying to systematically sample in a representative way the country broadly. They're looking for kind of really specific issues that they want to respond and attend to. Now that means some of the kind of social scientific work that I described, including our analysis of the three African countries, policy versus identity, we can make no comment about geographic representation. We, because we have none of that information in the data set. It could all be from Nairobi and Accra um, for all we know. Um, and that would therefore mean it, it was a, a comment not about the overall population of these countries. We know for sure it is only a comment about folks who are uh, using Twitter or Facebook, and therefore that immediately means there's a lack of representation um, of members of those communities who are not on social media platforms. So it's just a, it's a goal that we're not shooting for because the systems are kind of designed for slightly different purposes. 
Thank you. Um, while, um, while waiting for more questions, I, I have some follow-up questions, so I, I, I'll ask them. Uh, is there a sense that social media, while allowing sort of by, by the design of sort of what fuels this, um, um, sometimes the motives of the companies and others, is there a sense, however, that some issues that affect minor, some minor um, oppressed communities or underrepresented communities or minorities also have found more voice on the platform? So for instance, even in the realm of policy, is there a sense, for instance, that something like, I don't know, women's rights or um, or many other things that, or even for op oppressed minorities in some of the, in those countries, does the policy discourse in a way become more encompassing and inclusive, even as the platform itself may feel hate? Can you speak to that? Have you picked up anything uh, like that? Look, you know, even 15 years ago, I, I knew that these systems were Janus based, that for all the good things they may offer, like offering, providing voice to minority or under-resourced or underserved communities. For all the good things they might offer, there might be bad things, and it was just a matter of getting the balance right. And you are absolutely right. Uh, it is correct to say that, even just sticking to Facebook, Facebook allows um, groups to, form that would not have been able to form prior to some of these systems. And those groups are going to include um, um, minority populations, under-resourced populations, oppressed populations, at-risk populations. And we see this in Myanmar. We see ethno-linguistic and religious minority groups uh, doing a, a very good job of organizing over Facebook. And we see it in Kenya with LGBT groups doing a very good job organizing over Facebook. So then the question is, all right, um, does that mean we should be happy and just say, Facebook, well done, um, because our LGBT friends in Kenya are organizing or you know, most famously in the case of Myanmar, Rohingya populations are organizing. Uh, I personally would say, no, I don't, I'm not satisfied. Um, and I'm not satisfied because of this point that I made already, I think, which is increasingly the system seem to have a dominating impact that goes towards the darker side, not the lighter side. Um, we see a rise in populism globally. We see a, a systematic uh, decreasing in democratic democracies. In fact, that Freedom House score, I think half of the democracies have been in decline over the last five years, according to those, that's global. And that includes the US in decline. Um, and that decline in my estimation has some, um, some of that is explained by a rise of, of the dark side of social media. So all that is a long way of saying, yeah, of course, it's absolutely true. There are these great things that these systems to this day offer, including for, uh, connecting and providing voice to otherwise uh, underserved and at-risk communities. But the dark side seems to be um, overreaching the light side in our current lived experience. No, thank you for that. Um, I have one more question that connects to sort of this uh, global trend that you seem to be noticing and connecting to social media. It's almost my sort of uh, little empirical social scientist head that's um, coming here. So it's about if the method you're using can help us understand the limit or the root of identity politics. So one instance could be local elections or subnational elections. Okay, when Kikuyu in when in a Kikuyu region people are running for office. Do we get hints of where even a Kikuyu-based identity is coming from? Or do we get a hint at something else that's happening at that level that can then be offset nationally that we can start thinking of in terms of intervention? I love it. I mean, let's do that. We'll do it in 2022 in Kenya. After you, you, you still owe me a study in Shenzhen, um, so I'm going to shame you. <laughs> 
right now. <laughs> have that first, but then in 2022 we can do this sub-regional Kikuyu thing. Or actually, um, there I don't know when the next non-national election in Kenya is. Maybe there even is one sooner. In the case of Ghana, we're um, we may be able to get some purchase on that because we're rerunning in December the exact study we did five year, years ago in Ghana with the same queries and the same data sources. And then at least um, what we can find there, it's not quite spot on to your question, but it's, I think, adjacent. So there, what uh, we hope at least to be able to say is, if you remember from 2012 in Ghana, it was seven to one policy to identity, which was pretty darn good. We're like, wow, they're really using these systems to talk substance and not to just talk uh, identity. Um, if we rerun this more or less exact study, we're going to try to craft it to, uh, to be more or less the same. It helps that it's the same exact candidates yet again running. Um, what if we suddenly see the reverse? What if it's seven identities, seven to one policy relevant? Um, does that at least um, add fuel to this fire of an observation that there's this global trend? But you're right, a, a sort of sub-regional thing that, that um, could get out of the identity politics in that case of some particular tribal or ethnic linguistic group because everyone is of that tribe in this particular political context. Uh, we might find that they apply to other identity groups. So it could be, you know, there's some other identity categories for, the, for those um, stakeholders to exploit, or it could be that some other outcomes there. It's an interesting study idea. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, we are nearing the end of, um, of, of the session, but there are a couple of uh, additional questions that are here, and I think uh, they will be, um, I would like to make sure we answer them. So um, Michael has one technical, Michael Jankowski has one technical question and one sort of that actually will segue into your conclusion. So I'll ask him on to, to please unmute himself and, uh, and to ask his question. Take it away, Michael. Yes, hi there. Thank you very much. Um, I am curious how your platform handles memes and the text and the meaning inside of memes and uh, whether or not you're doing sort of AI vision detection of language, optical character recognition within these under-resourced languages and how you're handling all of the meaning and content and humor uh, and di potentially divisive language and images that can occur in the context of memes? Or are you particularly looking at the text around the tweet uh, and what the text that is in, that it makes up the tweet itself? Thank you. Thanks. So if you, if you caught on the screenshots of the software platform, the Aggie platform, um, the images from the posts in the case of Facebook or the comments in the case of Facebook or other platforms um, similarly, the, those images will be presented to the human trackers and then the human tracker can interpret the image and track it as whatever it is. So they could, if it has embedded text, they could read the text. And if it therefore it would become hate speech, they, they identify it as hate speech, it could be tracked. The classifier does nothing with images. And um, we have image ana analysis tools and actually image analysis people on the team. And we have talked about OCR as it, as an example of something we could do, but we, you know, it's sort of in the future work section. I would say it's nothing we've really um, targeted as uh, short-term activities that we're gonna undertake. So yeah, it, it would be possible to do it. I'm not uh, familiar of an OCR, an optical character recognition system for Burmese. I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't a good one. Um, so in, the, in many of these under-resourced languages, we probably would struggle with just the lack of OCR, existing OCR tools. So unless we're going to build one from scratch, that would be an additional hurdle. All right. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, 
Uh, I think this was great and insightful. Um, Mike, uh, for the best, thank you so much for giving in this talk and thank you for all the questions. Uh, I think this uh, concludes our, um, our talk. Uh, we're gonna give you a little bit of a virtual applause and then we'll wrap it up. <laughs> I right, thank you, and, and thank you to the entire team, Teresa, Karen, and, and the entire Kellogg staff for helping uh, put this together. Um, Y'all take care. Bye-bye. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.